Hey, you're about to hear a great word from our teaching team. At Freedom House, we're about equipping you to experience Christ's freedom every day. We would love to connect with you. We stream our live services Sundays at 1030 and 1215 Eastern Standard Time. You can join us at freedomhouse.cc slash live. I hope you enjoyed this message. And we are in a brand new series called Flipside. And you say, what in the world is a flip side? It's other than the other side of the record that you don't listen to. No, this is a different series. Uh, we we want to talk specifically about how Jesus turned the world upside down. In other words, what Jesus did when he came is he basically took ideas that the earth, uh, our, our thinking would think, would be normal and flip them upside down. Like he said, if you want to receive, you don't keep, you actually give. If you want to live, you, you, you don't just try to knock people over and try to get successful that way. You actually die to yourself. If you want to be great in life, then you serve. And so today, what I want to do is I want to talk specifically about something important. I want to talk about the flip side of promises. Look at your neighbor and say, I promise, I promise. How many of everybody had anybody say that to you? Just say, I promise I'll go to church with you. Raise your hand if you have, and they didn't come. How many said, I promise I'll get up early with you and read the Bible? Come on, right? they didn't do it. How many, how many ever had somebody say, I promise I'll give you that $50 back if you just loan it to me? Come on, and they never gave it to you. It reminds me of a story of a guy who was very wealthy, and he wanted to kind of show off how wealthy he was, and so he decided to, uh, in his pick, he had this huge barbecue, this big party he was having, and he says, I promise to give a million dollars to anybody who can swim across my pool. Everybody looked down at his pool, and it was filled with alligators. As soon as he made the statement, there was a splash. This guy starts flailing, getting across the, the the pool. I mean, he's flailing and swimming as fast as he can. Miraculously, he makes it to the other side. The guy grabs him, pulls him out of the pool, and says, Well, I made a promise. I'm going to give you a million dollars. He goes, Man, I don't care about the million dollars. I just want to know who pushed me in. <laughs> That's funny. I don't care who you are. I know. That's funny. That's funny. The thing about a promise, when anybody makes a promise, Specifically, if somebody wants to borrow money from you, uh, what you're going to do is you're going to check if they paid you back the last time. The reputation of the per person, the integrity of the person, the person who's given you the promise is going to determine whether you believe the promise or not. One thing I love about God is that the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, it says God is faithful. See, there's one person that you can always count on. When it comes to him making a promise. And here's what he says about promise. He says, for all the promises of God. And if you're wondering how many promises God gave us, he gave us 3,500 promises in the Bible that are for you and me. Notice he says, all the promises of God in Christ are yes and in Christ, amen. Notice that it says also at the end, sometimes we leave this part out because we focus so much on the fact that we get these promises we, we miss out that the reason why God fulfills the promise is he gets all the glory. It says, to the glory of God through us. When God fulfills a promise in God's people, he gets all the glory. He receives everything that's required. Now, there are some things that, that we need to understand about promises. So, so I want to give you a couple truths, and then we're going to look at some flip sides. Because I think there's also an underbelly. To the promise. Why well, haven't I got the promise? What's going on with the promise? I know I had one. So here's the first one I, I want you to write down if you're taking notes. The truth is, we don't qualify for promises. We don't qualify. I, uh, I love to play golf. I enjoy playing golf. I've been playing golf for over 30 years now. And I'm pretty good, you know, not real good. I enjoy the game. It's something I can play for the rest of my life. And one of the things I've done, the challenges that I've given myself over the last six or seven years is I try to qualify for this Charlotte Amateur Golf Tournament. This is where a lot of guys from the area, you have to live in Charlotte, Mecklenburg County, you can participate. It's a four-day tournament that starts with the qualification. You have to shoot a certain score in order to get in. I've only made it one time in six years, one time. I had to shoot, you have to shoot like 677, 78, which doesn't seem like a low score. For me, that's a good score. That's a decent score. Specifically, 
because I hate the golf course that we play on. I can't stand the golf course. Um, and, and, and I usually miss it by one or two strokes, which really makes me. One year I missed it by one stroke on the last hole. It was terrible. That's what everybody did when I told them that story. But, oh. Aren't you glad that God doesn't keep score with us? Aren't you glad that we don't have to qualify every day for the promise of God? I'm so glad that God doesn't keep score because some of us right now, we'd be in the negative on Sunday. Come on, it's, it's early. It's still only like just about 11 o'clock, somebody. I mean, and you already are in, you like already missed about more than five strokes. You still got the rest of the day ahead of you. See, here's the flip side. The flip side, when we understand this truth, is we confuse merit for worth. We confuse merit for worth. Now, this is how we've been trained on the earth. This is how we've been taught that we equate value with performance. Now, and this is what happens at our jobs. This is every, every time you go work. Um, and you better work or you're going to lose your job, right? If you don't perform, if you go to work tomorrow and just say, hey, you know what? I'm just going to hang around today. I'm just going to chill today. Um, you don't mind that, do you? You don't mind if I just kind of hang out and, and I just want to bless you with my presence. I'm not really going to do any work. How many know you're not going to stay on that job very long? You might make it a few hours, maybe a day if nobody finds out. But eventually, somebody's going to tell on you or your boss is going to find out. You can try that at school. You can just go, you know, I'm just going to show up to school. I'm not going to do the homework. I'm not going to take the quiz. I'm not going to take the test. No, you better perform in school or else you will fail. Now, when we take that over into God's kingdom... Often the way we look at God is through that perspective. We think God is good to us because we're good. I want you to notice something here. Same verse, different translation. It says, for all of God's promises, notice this, have been fulfilled in Christ. Notice your name's not in there. <laughs> Which is a good thing. Thank goodness it wasn't up to you whether God fulfills his promises. Now, this is a truth that we have to understand because if we put ourselves here that it is fulfilled in my performance, then we're gonna fail every single time. But it says, for all of God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ with a resounding yes, and through Christ, our amen. Our only responsibility is to go amen, amen. And that's how we treat our relationship with God. We equate value. We equate, just tell him I'll call him back. We equate value, equate value with performance. But see, here's what God thinks. Our value to God is never around what we do. Our value to God is never around what we do. It's not about what we do. And this is how sometimes we get in trouble because we think as long as I'm good, God's going to be good to me. Right? Right? As long as I don't sin, God's going to be good to me. As long as I pray enough, whatever that enough is, then God's going to be good to me. I better go to church on Sunday or God's going to be, not be good to me. Better read my Bible. Got to get at least five verses in, maybe two, maybe three chapters. It depends on whatever you equate your value to to God. Then I guess God's going to be good to me today. I read my Bible. That's how God thinks. Let me mess you up. See, God's goodness to you is not based on your good. God's good to you because he's good, period. Has nothing to do with you. Now, you say, well, that means I don't have to do any of that stuff. No, that's not the point. The reason why we pray and study and come to church and serve God and, and are nice to people and care for people is because we love God and we want to express him to as many people as we can. Show them the love of God. The sad thing is, is if we bring that into the mentality of the church, this is where religion comes from. We start to judge everybody based on their performance. And when we do that, here's what happens. Here's what happens. We become experts at identifying sin and novices at applying grace. This is the birthplace of legalism. This is the birthplace of judgment. Anybody ever been judged before? Come on, we all have. Raise your hand if you've ever been judged. We all have. How many of y'all have ever judged anybody? Don't raise your hand, but you know you have. 
You know you have. We all, we all have done that before. Why? Why is it that we point out other people's sins? Because it makes us feel better about ours. If I can point out to you that you're just a little bit worse than me, it makes me feel better about me. So I need to make sure I need to say, oh, I'm definitely not a mess, as much a mess as he is. Good gracious. I mean, he is a mess. I know I'm a mess, but not as much of a mess as he is. So then we take that right over into the reality. Well, then God looks at us that way. And that's not how God looks at you. Thank goodness I don't have to be good enough to receive the goodness of God because I will never be good enough. Jesus was the only one good enough and he died for me and he applied grace to my life. Thank God for his grace. Thank God for his grace. I love this verse in Psalms 37. Look at this. It says, the Lord directs the steps of the godly. He delights in every detail of their lives, though they stumble. Come on, we all stumble, don't we? But listen, don't judge somebody's stumble if you don't know their story. Don't be, don't be pointing your finger at somebody if you don't know their story. Though they stumble, they will never fall. Why? For the Lord holds them by the hand. That's how good God is. That's how good God is. Here's the second truth. The truth is it's in the waiting is where the promise is discovered. Here's the flip side. We don't like to wait. Come on, we don't like to wait. I love these new apps that they have now. I got this new restaurant I like to go to, and they have an app that you can order the food before you get there. Come on, somebody. I love it. I love to walk up in the, I mean, like, I'm just all, I'm just on the way at a stoplight because I don't text and drive, you know. What y'all look at me like that for? I put in my order about 10 minutes before I get there, right? Put in the order, show up at the restaurant, everybody's in line. How y'all doing? Bag with my name on it right here. Why? Because I don't like to wait. Starbucks app. Order your food before you get there. I can have my coffee. I don't have to wait in line. Who likes waiting in line? Nobody likes to wait. Why do they even have waiting rooms at doctor's offices? <laughs> don't get mad at me, doctors. I'm just trying to help you all out with your business. Just schedule the appointment so that when I walk in, I can go right into the... I don't want to sit and read a 1985 Vogue magazine. <laughs> I'm just saying. At least update the magazines to 2018. <laughs> Early in the 90s, somewhere in that range. And put some men magazines in there, like GQ or Men's Health or something like that, you know. We like to read, too. We don't like the way. Listen to Hebrews chapter 6. It says, we don't want you to become lazy. I love what the writer says. We don't want you to become lazy, but to be like those who believe and are patient. Patient. Everybody say patient. Patient. One, another word that the Bible uses for patient is perseverance. Those who believe and persevere and so receive. So here's how we receive the promise of God. We got to believe, have faith, and we got to be patient. And so receive what God has promised us. Look at Hebrews 10, verse 36. But you need to stick it out. Look at your neighbor. Say, stick it out. Stick it out. You got you to last. You got to have some lasting power. See, I think there are some things you don't get when you quit. And I also think there are some things that are reserved for people who, ha who can wait. They have the ability to wait. But you need to stick it out, staying with God's plan, so you'll be there for the promised completion. You'll be there for the promised completion. In other words, after you have done God's will, you got to endure God's wait. After you, after you have done God's will, there will always be a wait. One of my favorite stories is in the Bible is the story of Jacob. And one of the things that Jacob did, he, he, his name means deceiver. He was a deceiver. And he stole his brother's birthright. He had a twin brother by the name of Esau. For a, for a, you know, a, a bowl of stew, he took Esau's birthright, which was very important. And for the rest of his life, for the rest of Jacob's life, he was running from Esau. 
And so there was a moment in Genesis chapter 32 where he is getting ready to meet Esau again later on in life. And he's a little afraid, and so he sends his family away. And he's alone, Jacob is alone in this place called Bethel. And he gets in this wrestling match with God. The Bible says he starts wrestling with this man. And I love how Jacob, and this was a very important time for Jacob because this is when God changed his name. Changed his name from Jacob to Israel. And he became the father of the 12 tribes of Israel. But in the middle of this whole situation, something crazy happens. Something crazy because he understands. See, Jacob understood that a delay is not a denial. A delay is never a denial. So notice what he did in Genesis 32. He says, and he said, this is God. He was wrestling with God. And this is what happens to you and me in the middle of this promise. We start this wrestling match. It usually starts in our head. We start wrestling with God, right? We're wrestling, God, when, is it, when are you going to do this? What's wrong with me? This is where we go typically. Not, maybe not the right way, but we start thinking like that. We may go right to the qualifications. Well, what have I done wrong? And and you're not fulfilling this promise in me. You know, what do I need to do? Do I just need to try harder to get your attention? And so he's in this wrestling match with God. And God says to him, let me go for the day breaks. But he said, Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And listen, church, this is the attitude that you and I need to have when it comes to using our faith for the promise of God. I'm not going to let go until you bless me. I'm going to stand up. You can close the door in my face, but I'm going to be waiting when you open it up again. You can close the window, and guess what? I'll still be throwing rocks at it saying, hey, I'm waiting for you out here. That's the kind of faith that we need to have. That's the kind of perseverance that you and I need to have. Listen, listen. The greatest expression of someone's faith is not the obstacle or the thing that they get, but the length of patience your faith has. We, we a lot of times put a lot of emphasis on what people get because of their faith. God puts emphasis on the length of weight of your faith. He wants to see how, 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 faith, how your faith can persevere. Can you believe for that business? Can you believe for your healing and wait for it? Persevere. Endure. Endure what you need to do. Endure the... I, I love, let, me, let me tell you what Pastor James says. He says, my brethren... This is Pastor James, Jesus' brother. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials. This word trials... Is, is, means test. It doesn't mean temptations. God never tempts you, but he does test you. But here's the thing I love about God's test. You never fail. You just get retakes. And guess what? They're open book. And you can cheat off other people. Seriously. You can cheat off other Christians. It's called Community. That's why we encourage you to get involved in life groups. That's why we encourage you to get involved in serving. Why? Because there is somebody that has already passed your test that you're taking right now. So go find the one that has the most scars and go, how'd you get that scar? Tell me how. Is it, was it A, B, C, D, or all of the above? I want to cheat off of your passing the test. That's what it's like. You can cheat knowing. Here's what God says. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Why does he test me? Because he wants some patience with your faith, but let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect or mature and complete, lacking nothing. So our faith is incomplete if it can't wait. So it has to be able to wait. Don't quit. Don't give up. I love this verse in um, in, in in 2 Corinthians, we're going to get to in just a minute. I want you to hear this verse. But let me, let me tell you another truth here. The truth is, is God's promises don't have an expiration date. They don't have an expiration date. Now, I like leftovers. How many of y'all like leftovers? Raise your hand if you like leftovers. Now, not everybody's into them. I understand. You bring them home anyway. 
because you feel guilty. I'm not going to leave. And, you know, people say, well, you know, they're starving here and all that stuff. And, well, then mail the food. That's what I always say. Um, I like leftovers. I get excited about leftovers. Now, when my kids were a little bit younger, they had a tendency of eating my leftovers, which I didn't like very much. Nowadays, my kids don't do that. And so I get real excited. Sometimes I forget about that steak that I put in the refrigerator four days ago, five days ago, and I go back to it. And tell me if you're with me. You open the box. Little smell. <laughs> just little. Might have a little bit of growth on top, maybe. But nobody's around. <laughs> just scrape it off. You're going to heat it up anyway. Right? So it'll get rid of anything that's bad on it. Anybody ever done that? Come on, raise your hand. Come on, be, be honest in church. I've done it. I might have done it this week. The thing I love about God's promises is it doesn't matter how old they are. They have no expiration date. They're never going to expire. God could have spoke to you 25 years ago about a business still available. God could have spoke to you about your kids last year still available. So here's the flip side. The flip side is I don't see anything happening. God, you said I'm healed, but I still feel sick. God, you said my marriage was going to turn around, but I don't see anything. What, what, what do I need to do? Where, where do I need to go with this? Here, here's what I believe God does often with us. Our perspective, often our perspective will change before our circumstances will. Now, this is a very, very important truth that we have to remember. Often our perspective will change before our circumstances will. God's got to shift our pr- perspective. Let me say it another way that I think happens often and has happened in my life many times. Often our perspective will change and our circumstances will never change. And we got to be okay with that. Because we got to maybe see life from a different viewpoint. We got to see our financial picture. We got to see our relationships from a whole different vantage point. There's a guy by the name of Abram in the scriptures. And God t- comes to him in Genesis chapter 12 and tells him that he's going to bless him. He says, I'm going to make you a great nation. And when God says something like that to someone, it, it means that he's going to, for him to be great, it meant he was going to have a lot of kids. He says, I'm going to give you a land. People are going to bless you. And I'm going to bless you. People that curse you, I'm going to take care of them for you. I'm going to curse them. So I want you to leave Abram. I want you to go to this place. He was 75 years old when when God gave him this promise. 75 years old. Think about it. Five years go by, nothing happens. 10 years goes by, nothing happens. 15 years goes by, nothing happens. 20 years goes by, nothing happens. 25 years goes by, nothing happens. Now Abram is 100 years old. His wife is 99. She's not getting any younger. He's in the tent. He's in his tent. And this is, the tent was a representation of limitations. And this is what happens to you and me with the promise. Often we find ourselves, we we realize that our performance isn't going to bring the promise. We realize that we got to wait for it, but now we're pouting in a tent. We're looking at the ceiling going, guess that ain't going to happen. I guess I'm just too old. I guess... My past is just a little too messed up. I guess I failed too many times. I'm looking at all the walls of the tent, looking at all the problems that I've been through. I guess I'm never going to, this is never going to happen to me. We, get this, we start inviting people into our tent. Let me tell you, you know, we start having a pity party. But here's what God does in order to help Abram. In Genesis 15, then the Lord took Abram outside. And this is how God changes our perspective. And he said to him, look up into the sky. 
I need to get you out of the tent of your past. I need to get you out of the tent of the words that your parents spoke over you. I need to get you out of the tent of the family life that you grew up in that you think that never can change. I need to get you out of the tent of divorce. I need to get you out of the tent of broken relationships. Get you out of the tent of failure. Look up to the sky. And here's what I want you to do, Abram. I want you to count the stars if you can. Can you count them all? And you know, Abram, like one, two, 16. Man, I got to start all at one. Did I count that one? I don't know if I did. And the whole reason God is getting him to do this is because, listen, your descendants, this is how many descendants you're going to have. You're going to have this many kids. And there was a shift in Abram. Everything changed for him. And Abram believed the Lord. Believe the Lord, and the Lord counted him as righteous because of his faith. Because he believed, because he was get, able to change his perspective. I believe that's happening today. That if you can believe, if you can just believe that your impossible situation is nothing in the hands of a God who is bigger than an impossible situation. That there is, listen, there is no past that God can't erase. There is no mistake that scares God. There is no failure that you can't recover from. There is nothing. Oh, well, I don't know how the money's going to come. Well, God can make it rain. It can happen through the weirdest places. Look up to the sky. Come on, look up to the sky. Count the stars. I dare you. That's what God's saying. I dare you to challenge me. I dare you. Here's the last one. And this is the verse I wanted you to see. Look at 2 Corinthians 4. So we're not giving up. Come on, look at your neighbor. Say, I'm not giving up. I'm not giving up on the promise. Look at your other neighbor. Say, I'm not giving up on the promise. I'm not giving up. I'm not giving up. How could we? Even though on the outside it often looks like things are falling apart on us, on the inside where God is making new life, not a day goes by without his unfolding grace. These hard times are small potatoes. Just little tiny potatoes compared to the coming good times. The lavish celebration prepared for us. There's far more here than meets the eye. The things we see now are here today, gone tomorrow. But the things we can't see now will last forever last forever come on isn't that awesome awesome all right here's the last one here's the last one the truth is is my faith that releases the promise here's the flip side the flip side it's hard to always have faith isn't it it's hard to be the hero all the time it's not easy i want to tell you a story and some of you know this story but this story, this situation, is what helped Penny and I, 16 years ago, make a decision to come and launch Freedom House Church, which is 16 years old today. Isn't that fantastic? 16 years old. And if, honestly, if it wasn't for this, this, uh, this thing, with this, this what we went through, I don't think we would have ever stepped out. We were pregnant with our second child. We were about four or five months in. And you know, during that time is when you go and find out if you're good, what, what the gender of the child is going to be. So we were fired up. You know, we already had a little boy. Is it going to be a little girl? Is it going to be another little boy? We were really excited. So we go to the ultrasound. Now, this was back in the 90s. When ultrasound little, had little pieces of paper, nowadays you get like a clay figure and a bobblehead of what your kid looks like. <laughs> Crazy what they can do with ultrasounds these days. We go into the appointment, the doctor comes in, you know, and we're listening to the heartbeat and we're excited. About 30 minutes goes by and they're not really saying anything to us. 45 minutes goes by, not really saying anything to us. Hour goes by. They say, hey, can we move y'all to another room? We're like, what's going on? Nobody's talking to us. Nobody's describing anything. Is it a boy? Is it a girl? Now we're kind of concerned because what's, what's happening with this child that's on the inside of my wife? They take us to this other room, bigger machine. They've taken picture, 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 hundreds of pictures. 
over and over and over again. And then the doctor walks in. And she's got a box of tissues and a stack of pictures. And she says, I'm sorry. But your little girl has hundreds of tumors in her brain. Hundreds and hundreds of tumors. My wife starts to weep. I start to cry. She shows us a picture. She says, your, your daughter's brain should be black all inside of her head, but it's all gray. And that just shows you that she has hundreds and hundreds of tumors. And, and I need to let you know there are basically two outcomes that are going to happen. One of these two things is going to happen. The first thing that could happen to your daughter when she is born is that she will be a Down syndrome child. She'll probably live into her late teens, maybe early 20s. Her heart will be enlarged, probably holes in her heart, and she'll end up passing away. The second thing that could happen to your child is that your child could be an Edward syndrome child. And an Edward syndrome is basically they add an extra, there's an extra DNA added onto her DNA structure, and, and she'll, she'll die within the first year, Edward syndrome. Now, we can do this test and that test to discover which one you're going to have so you can be prepared for it. We chose not to do the test. In tears, I just, cry, I just prayed over my, my I said, Doctor, you can stay in the room or not, but I believe God can heal our baby. I believe that God can heal our child. We went home. Didn't tell a lot of people about it. You know, you don't tell, when you're going through something like that, you want to tell people that got faith. You don't want to tell knuckleheads that don't know how to say the right stuff. I want some people that are going to speak the right stuff over my child and over my life and over my faith. So we only told a handful of people. And I wish, honestly, church, I wish I could tell you that every day I was like Mr. Faith. But it was hard. It was really hard. I read this passage in Mark chapter 9 that really helped me, though. There was a father who brought a son to Jesus. Did everything right. Because that's what you wrestle with, man. You're like, what did I do wrong? What do I need to do right? What, what, why, why am I going through this, God? You promised this. Why, why I never got it yet? Couldn't hold the baby. Couldn't touch her. Couldn't lay hands on her. Couldn't anoint her with oil. We didn't know what to do. We just, all we had was our faith. I read the story of this father who brings his son to Jesus. His disciples couldn't cast the devil out of him. He's flip-flopping all over the place. Jesus shows up on the scene. The father runs, falls down at his knees. He says, Jesus, Jesus, I, I, I need some help. My son is demon-possessed, and your disciples couldn't cast him out. Will, will you help me? Will, will you help me? Will you do something for me? And he makes this statement to Jesus. He says, the father cries out and says, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief I believe but help my unbelief I got faith but right now it's hard God I want to believe will you, will you take my unbelief and give me some belief two months we're struggling Penny didn't get out of the bed a lot of times man there were many days where we cried together and prayed together and believed together we go back to the doctor same room, picture, 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 hour goes by, we're crying, hey, can we move you to another room, picture, 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 the doctor walks back in, she's got another box of tissue and a stack of pictures, except this time, she says, the box of tissues is not for you, it's for me, because I can't explain it, but your daughter is completely and totally healed, <laughs> completely and totally healed, there is no tumors in her brain. Come on, I said, God is good. He's a good God. Come on, stand up on your feet. Somebody say it with me. Say, God is good. Come on, say it. God is good. Come on, one more time. God is good. He's a good God. And His goodness is not dependent on whether I perform or not. Come on, some of us today, we got to keep sticking it out. Don't quit. Don't give up on that promise. For your mares. Don't give up on that promise for your business. God, I believe. Help my unbelief. If you need just a little boost to your faith today, would you just lift up both hands to heaven? Father, thank you for the anointing, the 
the Holy Spirit that is in this room, God. Thank you that faith is rising in this room. Believing for our children, believing for for our marriages, believing for new relationships, believing for new businesses, believing for changes in my financial picture, God, changes in my body. I am healed by the stripes of Jesus. I believe it, God. Help my unbelief. And I know, God, you are good. You're a good God. So today, we just lift you up in this place. We're so grateful. We're so thankful for the incredible promises. All of the promises of God are yes and amen in Jesus' name. Thanks again for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed this message. Don't forget to subscribe. And hey, if you want to find out more about our church or how you can be a part, go to freedomhouse.cc.